Hello, I'm Marites Vitug and welcome to Rappler Talk. We will be speaking to Patricio or Giorgio Abinales, as we call him, a professor at the School of Asian and Pacific Studies at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. And Giorgio is a co-author of the required reading now in some universities, State and Society in the Philippines. It looks at the history of the Philippines through five centuries, Philippine politics as well as institutions. So we thought that Professor Abinales can give a shed light on one of our institutions, the Philippine National Police. And we're taking off from the incident of June 29, wherein four police, four army officers rather, were killed by policemen in Holo. So welcome to Rappler Talk, Georgia. Thank you for making you. time from your home base in Hawaii. Thank so, you, I appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me, it's an honor. So you've looked at the Philippine National Police, I mean, historically, so maybe just a short a snapshot. Paano ba tayo nakarating dito sa Philippine National Police? I remember it was PC and then there was INP. Maybe mm -hmm. just uh, broadly to tell us. Well, the National Police, the police was actually formed in the American colonial period. So in 1901, they decided na there should be an internal police force to take over the U.S. Army in policing, you know, uh, that's insurgents, all that. And then in 1933, when Quezon, President Quezon and MacArthur set up the Philippine Army, the police shifted and they created a state police, which was um, then under the Ministry of uh, Department of Interior. And this was continued, can I just look at my notes? Uh, this was continued in the 1950s, where until 1955, when um, another a set of uh, re, uh, reforms that had to be done to improve the police eventually created um, the Philippine Constabulary. Um, so PC was set up in, um, let me see, uh, around uh, 1946, 47. So the PC then was in charge of provincial uh, uh, crime and order situation. But then the locals, the local, the city and town mayors, the police was passed on to that. Um, so they're supposed to take care of local area. Um, so that was the history. And then in 19, um, in the, the debate was who would take of the, the, who would take control of the police. The first attempt at centralizing it was under Marcos when he created the, uh, you know, uh, the, what did he call it? The, um, the, um, yeah, the, the, the PCINP, you know? So he created that, basically all the, P, uh, so created the PC, created the inter, uh, national police and subsume all the local police under that leadership. So it took it away from the mayors. But when Corey came over, she did something similar because she was afraid of the coup. So she did that until until Ramos when they decided that um, the police should be brought, sent back to the local mayors, the local officers. So that's the kind of, I don't know, that's the relationship we have with the police. On the one hand, it's um, it's local because it takes care of, uh, of peace and order situation in the city and the towns. Yet at the same time, it has to work together with the army. Uh, one last point, in 1978, um, Marcos decided that the police should be involved in counterinsurgency operations. So nag, nag, ano, nag overlap yung function ng army at military and police because the Philippine the army, as you very well know, was really a domestic army. It was not an external force because it be U.S. basis. Eh? So that has been the situation now. And it's become worse because as a result of changes in the American uh, training of police, uh, the police are becoming more and more militarized. Mm -hmm. The kind of training that policemen have in the U.S., which our policemen then get, is patterned after military operations. So that's... So if you look at the Black Lives Matter, you know, police nila really were armed. They even have like semi tanks. Ganun ang training ngayon with our police. So, so that's the, the problem. That's the issue now overlapping. At the same time, and last point is that because the police after '46 were under the mayors, they were also poorly paid. 
they were badly trained. And then basically, the, the, you get appointed as a, a member of the police force via patronage politics. So you may or may have it. So you have overlaying that and then that problem. So confused, it's confused. The character pala of our police is confused. It's militarized, yet the constitution says civilian in character. So hindi na, hindi na nag-improve ito through the years. I mean, uh, it's already 2020, ano tapos? Uh, so Jojo, why has it remained this way? Because it seems to be like a habit. I mean, Marcos centralized things. The Gong Duterte also has centralized the police. That's the big problem. Second is it really doesn't, it's not well defined. Uh, in, 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 in theory, the army is supposed, the military is supposed to be for external defense. But given the communist insurgency, the MNLF's uh, separators in the 70s, uh, our army became a domestic counterinsurgency force. In paper, it should be the police that should take care of that. Pero hanggang ngayon, uh, what Duterte has done is to revive something that Marcos did, which is to uh, give the police further uh, leeway to engage in counterinsurgency operation in support of the army. Okay. Uh, in providing intelligence, policing the, the towns, uh, supposedly secondary, but in a lot of areas, they actually assume, think that they have the same importance as the military. So in addition to counterinsurgency, uh, President Duterte also tasked them to implement the drug war. Yeah. So what's yeah. the impact nito sa police? Because they were already doing counterinsurgency and then this came in a new war that they had to be the main implementers of. What's the effect on the PNP? Well, the, if you notice the way they conduct the drug, uh, the drug raids, you get them in some lot of the documentary. It's how the military conducts raids. So there's nothing, no, nothing different anymore. Um, Duterte just expanded the role of the police uh, in terms of uh, civil containing civil disturbances. So in the countryside, they are with the army in terms of pursuing uh, insurgents. But in the cities, okay, they are implementing, they, they have, you know, official control. The military doesn't come in except this COVID, no. But the way they're implementing this drug war really is reminiscent of how the army, the Marines, conduct raiding operations. So yun yung, I know, yun yung, uh, that's different from the way the police, uh, well, in the 80s, they just killed everybody, no? <laughs> Ito, they just, they really raid communities, which is yeah, very, very unusual. So the, the a key problem here is the, milita as you said, militarization of the police. So mahirap bang i-divorce? Can they, can they be demilitarized? Is there a way to civilianize the police force? Well, there are two things that you have to also figure out. Uh, the training of the police, okay? Who gets to become the policeman? Uh, how many hours, how many years before somebody can become a policeman? That's very unclear, okay? Uh, in fact, by as late as 1980s, uh, there were still problems. Maraming hindi pumasa ng civil service. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is the police is really also used by local officials. You know, in promoting their own interests, either as security detail, either as um, private, you know, private security, but also it's really very much tied to local politics. So you have to do two things. One, you have to professionalize the police by, you know, things like civil service exams, etc. And the other one is you really find, have to find a way to take the control of the mayors out of them. But the only way to do that is you nationalize it. Which Marcos and Corey did, but then you cannot sustain this because the mayors, if you want to run for political office nationally, you need the mayor's support, and mayors would always say, "Ibalik niyo sa amin yung police." So we're going back and forth between uh, control of the police. The Americans thought that the local officials, when they become trained and well educated, etc., not corrupt, they would take care of the police. But then Marcos and then Corey and Duterte said, no, cannot be. You have to control it. What Duterte has done is a mix of Marcos and Corey, which is still allow the mayors to control the police force, but then 
Uh, this Cory Palaito, Cory, under Cory, uh, she said the mayor should be, uh, the police should be reverted to the mayors unless, except for emergency situations. So it all boils back to 86 and in, in, in 87 when uh, Mrs. Aquino reorganized the police force. So let's look at the situation in Holo. Is this the first, would you know, Giorgio, of any other incident or similar situation wherein police killed uh, military officers? Their brothers in arms. Well, the one in Channel Four, I think the one in IBSABN now. I think the ones who were uh, trying to neutralize the sniper were police members of the police force. Um, well, the other one was Mama Pasano, you know. Mama Sapano. Yeah, where in the police came out with their own strategy independent of the military. So this is uh, uh, that's what's scary now, Marites. If you look at Hulo, it can be actually traced back to Mama Sapasano, where the police could say, okay, we'll develop our own strategy. We won't inform the army. Mm. So you, you mean that uh, this the, the killings in Hulo in June last month really are rooted pala in this uh, strategy of, in this uh, tactic of the police? To well, do the, 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 yeah, the unclear relationship between the military and the police vis-a-vis -vis the insurgency. And I think if you go by Ma Ma Mama Pasano, there's very little sharing of intelligence between the two, the force, two, two services. Um, uh, in part because I think after the 80s, leadership of the police uh, was coming from the Philippine Police Academy. It was easier in the past because PMA officers could be appointed to police uh, uh, police uh, police positions, senior positions, which created tension between the two. But now, na, na ongoing na yung police academy, they don't need PMA officers anymore. So yung link at the at top level through MISTA and class is not there. It's not. It's a it's weaker now compared to the past. So uh, again. Of course, the National Bureau of Investigation is still looking uh, looking at what happened. But uh, do you think parang it also has a layer of local, as you said, local politics, these killings yeah. in law? If we cannot just look at mm -hmm. it as, as um, on a national level, there is a layer of Sulu politics. What do you think? What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think all of you have written about it, which is how local politics uh, the drug network, the smuggling network, and the terrorist network are like completely inter interrelated to one another. So they were looking for an Abu Sayyaf operative. Okay, we actually don't know who this guy is. I think we should pursue this farther. And most likely, there must be a relative in the police force. But if you look at Rido, I mean, yeah. family yeah. clash, it's different guy. Uh, people, the ones who clash come from different services of the military and the police. So there's that angle, no? Uh, what exactly, uh, how, what is exactly the relationship between the police and the military vis-a-vis -vis intelligence on the Abu Sayyaf? We don't know that. That's the thing that's really missing. Uh, second is, what is the relationship within the, 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 the director of the police force in that, in Holo, and the local military commander. Which means, um, in one, uh, this is very uh, evident in the way na walang coordination. Mm. And, and again, it goes back to Mam Pasano um, when, you know, the police have their own operations going. So uh, is it a combination of local politics, uh, relationships with each other vis-a-vis -vis the clans or the, you know, the divided and lack of coordination between the military and the services, it, it most probably is everything. Um, but, you know, a an intrepid journalist should look at the connections between chief of police, which is appointed, no? uh, which is, has worked closely with local mayors and the military. Um, so, and about the judges, there's also a rivalry or a turf war between the police and the oh, military. Yeah. Yeah, in the 70s, there were complaints by the police leadership that the PMIers have taken over the the institution. You know, when in fact, PMA are trained to be a military, Air Force, Navy, young services that's uh, for 
external defense. So that's why they created the Philippine, uh, the Philippine Police Academy in part in response to that. But it also meant na nagkaroon na ng rivalry in the Lawa. And complicating the fact is wala ng constabulary. Okay, the constabulary used to be also the, it was a domestic, you know, uh, police force right? covering the provinces, but it was also manned by members of the, you know, alumni of the Philippine Military Academy. So that's, that's one thing that has to be looked at. There was a commentary today here in Manila about Non, the non-laban culture that the police always use when they in the drug war non-laban sila kaya yeah. na sila pinatay so the commentar, commentator was saying that this culture has is so entrenched that it claimed their brothers in arms uh, but do you think this is just the non-laban i mean it's more than the non-laban culture it's right more than that remember non-laban is a urban phenomenon Okay, and second, Nanlaban is against an arc, uh, a suspect who doesn't have guns. See where they plant them? After they kill them, they plant guns. Uh, this is completely different because, you know, this is one military unit vis-a-vis -a -vis another police unit. And both, I'm sure the police know, knew that these guys were military, you know, they came out and said, Sundalo kami. Uh, so this is not Nanlaban. This is completely different. Uh, there's a completely different relationship. Um, between the two services. I see. But uh, the police said that the, the military disguised these four men that were uh, pointing their firearms at them. So they, they also use it as, uh, as an excuse, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... In that yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, that's how... I mean, that it goes back as far as the hooks, right? The hooks, <laughs> so we had to kill them all. Um, yeah, so... And that's perfect, excuse me. Probably it's the use of the non-laban to justify the killing, but it's completely that a different context of the use, different context in the use of that phrase. Was there yes. ever a time, Jojo, in her our history? Because this is also on the issue of corruption, no? Yeah. The ang daming, ang daming terms sa naginagamit natin to describe the police, eh? potong, culture, anyway. <laughs> Was there ever a time ba in our history that there was a golden age for uh, There were two, two instances. One was EDSA, but it's very specific to the Metropolitan Police. And the Manila Police is very strange because it serves two leaders, the president and the mayor. So Metrocom, when Alfredo Lim decided to switch side, and at the second day of EDSA, everybody fell in love with the police. The second <laughs> one actually was under Ramos. Remember Ramos purged the Philippine National Police leadership because of the kidnappings and everything and changed everything and actually implemented a couple of things, including merit exams. Oh, so for a while under, during Ramos, pardon. Huh? I'm sorry, did, was it just under Ramos that he gave, there yeah, were merit yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, and then Strada changed everything. Uh, so actually, in, by the last two years of Ramos, the person, the approval, the positive perception of the police went up. So these were the only two periods in our time. And, and um, if you look at it, Ramos' time, you have, Ramos was really a professional soldier, no? He really understood that the, for the police to function effectively, you have to implement the same kind of professionalism in any government agency. So it worked. And he purged, he purged mm -hmm. the General Nazareno, the law kicked out. Um, after that, wala. So, lack of continuity. Actually, under Arab, you said he's, he uh, did not continue any of this. No, well, so he no didn't know how to go, go burn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so after Arab, Gloria Arroyo, in her nine uh, years, what did she do to reform the police? She, she, no, she, she just sent it back to the local uh, the mayors. I mean, this, mm -hmm. this is a president who relied mainly on local alliances. So, so Ramos was the only one who really looked at it from above. Um, after that, we're back to the same ritual now. Pub, with the police, public responsibility expanded. Okay. And Noy Noy, uh, Pinoy, actually, because of Mampasano, showed us the extent to which this, you know, kind of tension, this kinds of independent, autonomous actions have reached a, a certain point. 
diba? They were after a Malaysian terrorist. It's a military operation, but they did not. So, so just one more thing. The, the yung response, rapid response team ng police, diba? yung, the ones that were sent to Mampasano, that's a military kind of unit. Diba? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's because of the insurgency, uh, the, insur the, the separatist rebellion, Islamic terrorism, that the police had to create such units, which used to be the domain of, you know, the Marines, the SEALs, etc. Yeah. So, uh, on another issue, the corruption is said to be embedded in the Philippine National Police. Is it, is it really that widespread or is it the same in other institutions? Are we just exaggerating corruption in the police? No, actually, as early as <laughs> the 1950s, the United States, the Philippine government asked the, uh, a, a team from the United States to do a survey of the state of the Philippine police force. The same problem, corruption, inefficient system, lack of training, lack of leadership, are the same ones you can see now. And one of the things that's fascinating is consistent. So there was one in the 50s and there was another one in the 60s that Marcos uh uh, 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 special survey that Marcos did. Consistently, it's the low pay. Uh, there was even in the 1950s problems like, um, let me look for it, okay. Uh, as low uh, problems like they can't send their, <laughs> they can't send their children to school. Kasi malit yung sueldo. There was a problem or they didn't have, have a, 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 a hospital to, uh, I can't find it, but I didn't have any hospital to take care of them. So it's a very inadequate uh, institution, in part because it's dependent on the local police, uh, local mayors. But uh, uh, sorry. under Duterte, Diba uh, Jojo, he, the president, increased, well, approved the increase of salaries of police. Yeah. yeah. So what is the, so dapat, one of these, uh, at least dapat mag-improve na yung police, so hindi pa rin. Uh, well, <laughs> sure. this was 1950. I mean, the other thing that you have to uh, consider is how much the informal economy, drugs, guns, smuggling, human trafficking, have become an important source of revenue at the local level. Diba? So, so, ibig sabihin, even if bayaran ka ng 50,000 a month, there's still the, you know, the attraction of the other side. Um, um, in the past, um, the police were able to get things extra because the mayors would create a special force. Pero uh, ngayon, it's not clear. Um, think of the Ampatuans, for example, the ones who protected them. If you go to, you know, Maguindanao, it's, it's uniform people that, uh, uh, that you know, um, are heading it. So, so uh, question yeah. is, yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead. So it's more profitable now to be in a police, to be a policeman. Because on the one hand, in Tinakas ni Duterte yung sweldo, but on the other hand, you're exposed to a, a country where, as Al Makoy mentioned, a historian Al Makoy mentioned, like over 40% of what's going on is related to the illicit sector. So one final question, Giorgio. Has the killings, has the Sulu uh, incident compromised the PNP? I mean, not just in Sulu, but nationally. Because this think, is some are yeah. seeing, yeah? I think this is upping the ante. Remember, in, again, to go back, Mama Pasano, know, the police had their own strategy. Okay? And then that kept quiet. They kept quiet to that because of the controversy. But this one is really upping the ante because... Uh, it's the services now going after each other. The only time, I, I forgot, the only time that there was a confrontation within the constabulary and to a certain extent the, special, the army was in 1950 when uh, Governor Laxon of Negros you know, he used the police and his private army to terrorize everybody. And Kirino was forced to send the police, uh, the, the PC, and then later on, Pagsaysay. To neutralize Laxon. So that was the only time that the clash in the Lava. Um, we don't know, but maybe there's you know petty clashes going on, but this one is really big in part because of the video.
Yes, and also the president himself went to Zamboanga, spoke to the nine policemen, and the mm. police then separately spoke to the military. So he's really giving it a lot of focus. And he said that siya lang daw yung presidente na ganun ang pagmamalasakit at suporta para sa armed troops. Well, Tama, you, have, historically. Yeah. <laughs> you have to hide the fact that you can't, you know, you've created a situation where you've armed these two groups separately. And the, you know, the only thing is to be able to coordinate it, but it's absent there. Well, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a publicity campaign. You go talk to the nine policemen and the military, and, you know, his uh, spin, spin masters would say, well, see, he really takes care of it. It doesn't solve the problem, though, of overlapping, you know, uh, uh, overlapping missions. In fact, what's worrying a lot of scholars of the police now is how the police has become increasingly militarized. And you're not even talking of the Philippines, you're talking of the United States and all police, uh, the way police training are going on now among different countries uh, that send their kids, their officials to the U.S. It's, you know, it's quite disturbing. Why is this phenomenon? Is it not, I mean, you said it's not just the Philippines, no, it's even also in the U.S. Yeah, there's a journalist that wrote about the militarization of the police. Um, and um, what he's recovered is that a lot because of Afghanistan and Iraq, mm -hmm. there's a lot of surplus equipment that the military had to bring back. And who do you give it to? They gave it to the police. But in giving back these resources, you have to also provide these folks training. You know, how do you train to use a tank or you know? And that the surplus of these resources, plus the fact that they have to be trained. It's a, it's a military type of training. So if you look at the Black Lives Matter protests and how the police have been treating them, you see something similar to what, uh, you know, some of the uh, tactics that the military use is very much similar to, you know, the police use is similar to what the military has been doing. So there's a militarization going on um, in the U.S. And what's interesting to look at is the, the, the police, the junior officers that we sent it to say, uh, you know, the police academies in the U.S., do they create, you know, invite mm -hmm. model and bring it back? Mm -hmm. That's, that, I mean, the, this book just came out. Um, I'll send you the title later on. Oh, it's fascinating, Georgia, really fascinating to have spoken to you. At least we have zoom, zoomed out of the issue and presented the deep-rooted problems, no? So Thank we hope you, yeah. to talk to you again and to our viewers. Join us in future uh, conversations. And uh, this one with Professor Abinales, we talked about the history, deep-rooted uh, problems facing the Philippine National Police. And hopefully in the future, we will look at other Philippine institutions. Thank you so much. And thank you, Curtis. Thank you for, you know. For, we, we have taken much of your time while you're preparing dinner there in Hawaii. <laughs> OK, <laughs> so goodbye. Thank you, George. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.